Good morning, folks. I'm Dan. This is a little show off and tell because I guess that's what we want to do on YouTube is we want to show off what we do. But I wanted to talk about foundry practices a little bit too. As we've been doing the um, casting or the pattern for the casting for the fifth bearing for on our Corvair engine for our flight engine. And if you haven't seen those, of course, we'll put a link up there to, to show where they are so you can go see those videos. But I think sometimes I kind of give the impression that I just approach some of this stuff kind of haphazardly and, and go along and do my thing. And I don't, that's not the case. I want everybody to understand that I'll spend as much time necessary on this casting and just about everything else I do, I'll spend as much time as is necessary to get the results that I want to get out of it. Um, but I also think that we spend a tremendous amount of time overthinking things. Uh, castings, sand castings, um, whether it's sand casting, whether it's lost wax, whatever, whatever the foundry process may be, um, it's, we've made it very technical in this day and age, but this is stuff that people have done for hundreds of years. You know, we're not, we're not doing anything that, um, somebody you know sitting in their grass hut hasn't been able to do you know in their mud hut a hundred years ago wasn't able to do so a lot of the times like i say it it looks like i'm i'm just going along my merry way and do, 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 you know and and we'll see what comes out but i usually have a a pretty good idea of what the results are going to be um and and this fifth bearing is a perfect example i'm very comfortable with the way this is going along and i i expect to have a very nice casting out of this pattern when i'm done so I, I just kind of wanted to clarify that. Um, I've been casting for a lot of years, you know, I've been doing, been doing a fair amount of foundry work. And I said early on that I really wasn't using proper pattern making techniques to do this. And I'm really not. Um, of course, the proper way probably would have been to either sit down at the drafting table or on the, the CAD program on the computer and draw this out and dimension it all. But the only real dimensions that I felt I needed were where it mounts on the, or the primary dimensions that I needed were how and where it mounts on the front of the, of the engine. So those are the dimensions I ran with. If I was building it properly and doing the drawings, I probably wouldn't be 50% done with the pattern. I'd probably still be sitting at the computer or at the drafting table working all, out, all of that out. Um, if I was working off of a set of prints, I would allow shrink allowances, um, and they make shrink rules for that so that you allow for that shrinkage when you measure them out. These are two examples. These are both sh steric shrink rules. Uh, one of them is a number 370, which is a eighth inch to the foot, I believe. And the shrinkage allowance is one eighth inch per foot on with iron. So this is the, uh, is, this is the rule you would use if you're casting cast iron. For aluminum, it's usually 5 30 seconds to 3 sixteenths of an inch. And 3 sixteenths is usually what you'll find for a shrink rule that are, that are used for allowance. So what that means is for every foot, every foot of your pattern lengthwise. So if, if this pattern were a foot long from, from this point, back to this point why it's going to shrink three sixteenths of an inch five thirty seconds to three sixteenths of an inch so when you build your pattern you build it that extra three sixteenths of an inch to accommodate that so you come right down to dimensions once it's cast and that shrinkage will vary with the alloys the temperature how it's poured how your molds made um all of those type of things so i didn't allow extra shrinkage on this um the reality is once i go back and and install my fillets and everything and we get to sanding all these contours why i will add some filler on the edges of those so we're going to build that up a little bit plus being a loose pattern where we're going to um, mold the pattern directly into the sand and then work the pattern to get it out when we wrap that pattern why we're going to make that um, indentation in the sand larger anyway so it's kind of a wash you, you're still going to be have a little more shrinkage than um just the size of the pattern but it's going to be very close and for this application it doesn't need to be any closer than that i think i've allowed plenty of room and i think it'll be fine so that's just a little thing on on um foundry work or pattern making for that i tend to do everything a little bit minimalistic um i i don't need to I don't want to spend any more time doing something or make it any more complicated than it has to be usually. There's exceptions to that, but for the most part, if I'm just trying to accomplish a task, I, I'm only going to work to the 
to the necessary amount of precision. And foundry works one of those things. Um, most things that are cast in the home shop, we don't need to allow for for extra shrinkage. It's just not that big a deal. We're not casting that big a part. Um, perfect example is going to be, well, I'm going to show off a couple little projects here. And one of them is a corn tool and cutter grinder. Let me move this around. This is a corn that I built several years ago. It, um, it looks a little ragged now. It's been sitting in the drawer and, and I just now pulled it out for this. It needs to be cleaned up and we need to have some more work done on it. But anyway, I built this little corn years ago. It's got aluminum castings in it. And these castings were all done off of my patterns. I made the wood patterns for all of these. And uh, this doesn't show all of them. I still got uh, long bed attachments with the centers and that type of thing. But the, the main castings, this casting, the casting in behind, um, and all the wheel head assemblies were cast here in the shop. Um, it's basically a stock corn. I've got, uh, actually I've got patterns for wheel guards. Um, and I cast, I think, one wheel guard up. I don't have it out here. And I've got the pattern for the belt guard on the other side. And I haven't bothered to cast that just because I haven't taken time to finish it out. Um, there again, this is a working machine. I use it primarily to sharpen end mills, uh, the ends of end mills. If I'd get off my rear and do it, and it may be a project down the road, I need to build an air bearing for this so that I can sharpen the flutes, the side flutes of, a, uh, of an end mill. And that's the primary use that this has. It, uh, it works really well. You know, I'm, I'm real happy with it. It does what it's supposed to do. It's a little bit finicky as far as a tool and cutter grinder, but it is very versatile. So anyway, that's one of my little projects that I built. I didn't allow any shrinkage for any of these castings. For the size of the castings, there's plenty of room in them. Um, all of the adjustments work as they should. It, uh, it's got the tilting head. We've got our adjustment there. All of those things and there's still little things that need to be done um, it needs the the bar hook to go underneath to keep it from dropping over center that type of thing but anyway this is one of the projects that was built years and years ago works well I, uh, I use it periodically it's it hasn't been out in probably the last six months but anyway that's one of my little projects another one that comes out that will probably eventually be a production item there's a few of these out in the world already I probably got a half dozen of these out is a rifle rest that I built and this is my own rifle rest this was um, this was cast back in well the serial number on it is uh, serial number on it's 001 this is the first one that came off it's dated 10 of 97 so this was completed in 1997 and it's got my logo on it it's a Hills gun and uh, at the time that I built the patterns for this it was what I considered to be the best of all worlds that was out there. Um, I had opportunity to look at Wichita Rests. A Wichita Rest was available to me. And I think we had some early Sinclair stuff was just starting to come out. And this was, uh, this was based off of what I felt was the best of both worlds. You've got a speed screw up on the front, which this is actually a Sinclair speed screw. This is not my own speed screw. Um, but any of these that I produce in the future will have my own design speed screw on them. Interchangeable tops, um, well the adjustments are is we've got windage adjustment on the top. We have a fine elevation which adjusts up and down there. We've got a coarse adjustment which works off of a rack and pinion. Oh, it's cold enough out here everything's stiff but when it's all lubed up why um, it works well. Coarse adjustment on the rack and pinion and then fine adjustment on the hand wheel and I've got interchangeable tops and I've got about well I've got three different three more tops for this particular rest and I haven't bothered to finish them up I just powder coated them a few weeks ago just because I was anxious to do something but they'll have a completely interchangeable top so and what I've done is we've got different different bag styles and bag widths on the top is the, is the reasons for them um, and I've got a there's a nylon I've got a couple of the leather leather tops in different sizes so it all goes in my shooting bags but eventually I'll have at least four interchangeable tops for these so when I do take it to the range I can be um, setting up any rifle or any forend width that I've got like I say this is an early early model it was the earliest model um, forend stop on it and I beat that up a little bit I've changed this design a little bit as time's gone on but this is probably an item that will eventually go back into my into my little store at hillsgun.com 
we've got several things going on and I'm kind of excited for 2018 to come along because we've got some casting stuff coming out. I've got, um, I've got three projects for airplane tooling right now. And Greg, if you're watching, I did, uh, I have redone the tooling for the flanging dies. So hopefully I'll get them done, but I'm, I, I think solved my problem. I had a, had a problem with, um, a flanging one flanging die out of about five sets that on the larger die we had problems with it separating and the glue just did not adhere and I wasn't sure how I was going to redo those so I figured that out it's a pretty simple solution that uh, I think it's going to work well but anyway those will be back in the store hopefully by the end of January I'm going to I'm going to completely redo the tooling for those so we've got quite a bit of stuff going on but this was just kind of a little show off video I did want to clarify that about the fifth bearing parts I I think that um a lot of this stuff can be done quite easily. I and the things that I try and show are going to be how to do things with maybe not the latest and greatest equipment, and not the the newest things that we think we have to have in our disposable society. So, hopefully, I've given a little bit of inspiration along the way someplace, and um, hopefully that'll give you some ideas for your projects. So, I appreciate you guys taking the time to watch. Um, 2017 has been kind of an interesting year, and uh, this YouTube stuff is kind of intriguing to me, so we'll continue to play with it a little bit and see see where we go with it. Um, if you've got any suggestions or comments for me, why, go ahead and leave them in that comment section below. If you hit the subscribe button, why, you'll, uh, you'll help me along a little bit, and uh, if you hit the bell notification, you'll know when I put out a new video, whether it be something in the shop or something for the airplane or, or whatever we've got developing. So I appreciate you guys. Have a happy and safe new year, and thanks for taking the time to watch.